Okay, welcome everybody. Let's get started. Um, I am going to introduce uh, Dr. Jessica Gilman from NOAA, Crosstown. And I apologize, but this is going to sound a little robotic because I'm reading from her bio. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Dr. Jessica B. Gilman is a research chemist at NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratory in Boulder. She joined the Chemical Sciences Division in 2006 after receiving her PhD in Analytical and Atmospheric Chemistry from CU Boulder. Her research focuses on understanding the emissions, chemical evolution, and atmospheric impacts of organic compounds in Earth's atmosphere. To accomplish this, Dr. Gilman utilizes several custom-built gas chromatography mass spectrometry systems to measure and identify hundreds of different volatile organic compounds. She is a principal investigator of these instruments has, and has deployed them along with her team aboard research vessels, the NOAA WP-3 research aircraft, and at ground sites across the United States. Recent publications include the measurement of VOC emissions from the petrochemical industry in Houston, Texas, industrial emissions related to oil and natural gas production in several shale basins ac across the United States, biogenic emissions from forests in California and the southeastern US, emissions related to biofuel production, urban emissions in the highly populated Los Angeles basin, biomass burning emissions, as well as hal halogen oxidation of VOCs and ozone depletion events in the Arctic marine boundary layer. So let's welcome Jessica and enjoy her talk. All right, well, thank you. I guess uh, if it emits VOCs, we try to measure it. So <laughs> um, today I wanted to talk about um, the collection of work that a whole bunch of us have been doing on oil and natural gas over the last uh, six or so years here. I wanted to try to give as broad of an overview as possible and highlight the work of as many of my colleagues as possible, um, both at NOAA, CSD, the Global Monitoring Division, and then other research institutions um, across town. So hopefully I'll do a good job of that. And there's uh, much more work that I can't fit in a 50 minute talk. So. Um, the outline is shown there, so I wanted to start with a brief uh, background on shale oil and natural gas uh, production, and then go on to how we characterize some of the emission sources. And I wanted to do this on a sort of a micro scale, so these process level, what happens on an individual well pad to the much broader um, regional sources, such as these large shale basins uh, shown on the maps there. We can look at the uh, source signature from oil and natural gas emissions, so how does it differ from all of those other VOC sources that John just mentioned, and then also look at uh, the characterization of emissions, and I'll show you that they are unique to each individual basin and give you some examples of how we calculate uh, some of the mass fluxes. And lastly, a very broad overview of the environmental implications. These are basically the things that I find most interesting, and so hopefully uh, you will too. So the general goal of this is, of course, to characterize the emissions of both methane and VOCs uh, from shale oil and natural gas operations in order to assess both the climate and air quality impacts of the energy production. So what I wanted to show here is that the shale boom has occurred very recently. Um, so only since 2005, we saw rapid production in shale gas, which is now at a historic high. We've never produced more natural gas than we have now from uh, shale formation shown in blue there. And crude oil production is near the all-time high. And collectively with both of these, shale formations now account for over half of the uh, fossil fuels from natural gas and crude oil that are produced uh, within the United States. And that production is expected or projected by the uh, Energy Information Administration to continue increasing over the next few decades. But it's important to note the only way you can sustain this level of production is to keep drilling new wells. So once you drill a new well, production from that individual well uh, decreases quite rapidly, exponentially, so that over the whole course of a well's lifetime, one third of the emissions occur within the very first year of production. So the only way to keep uh, increasing production is to keep adding more and more wells and bringing them online. And the dates in yellow here, which maybe don't quite uh, show up so well, are the NOAA CSD studies. And of course, there have been many groups um, that preceded the NOAA study dates. 
And so I wanted to also point out that uh, both shale basins as well as an individual well can produce both oil and gas. So it's not one or the other, but they exist essentially on this sort of continuum. And what we did for the SOGNEX or the shale oil and natural gas nexus is we targeted shale basins that were within reach of the aircraft. So we had to be able to get there. We were also interested in sh uh, setting basins that are mostly natural gas production, but also uh, crude oil production shown um, in the purple color there. And I've also added to this graph uh, the number of active drilling wells within each basin. So this gives us a very simple proxy for the new uh, amount of activity that's going in. So the new wells uh, that are going. And so we see uh, the Marcellus is mostly a natural gas basin. We studied that in 2013. And compare that to basins like the Eagle Ford and the Permian, which have much higher overall production rates. But it's again, this mix of oil and natural gas and they currently have uh, the most number of drill rigs. So this is where the active uh, drilling operations are occurring. So if we look at the composition of raw natural gas, raw natural gas, of course, contains methane. That's the primary component. But depending on the formation that it comes from, it can contain uh, appreciable amounts of non-methane hydrocarbons, which I will collectively call volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. And this composition has many different impacts. The first of which is on the environment. So methane is a greenhouse gas. It's more potent than carbon dioxide. But we also know that burning, clean burning natural gas, you will produce less CO2, CO, SO2, particulate matter, all of these different things um, per unit of energy consumed compared to other fossil fuel sources, particularly coal. So there is a reason, a climate benefit for switching over to natural gas uh, power plants, for instance. But if an appreciable amount of this methane is leaking to the atmosphere, that climate benefit of reducing the amount of CO2 is offset by the leaks in this very powerful uh, greenhouse gas. And for the air quality implications, uh, particularly for the VOCs, so certain VOCs are air toxics, uh, including benzene and toluene. But there are also important precursors to things like uh, the photochemical formation of ozone and uh, organic aerosol, both of which are an, uh, unhealthy to breathe, degrade local air quality, affect visibility, um, and so on. So having low ozone and low ozone precursors is generally um, a very good idea. And lastly, some of the human health implications. So I won't be talking much um, about that since that's not our area of expertise. But again, we have uh, the release of these air toxics, uh, one in particular, hydrogen sulfide, which we just now have um, some new measurements of that uh, particular compound, are found in what is called uh, sour gas. So you have to be able to remove this hydrogen uh, sulfide, and it's an extreme uh, irritant. And so if we look now at uh, the chemistry of some of these uh, individual compounds, so here I'm plotting uh, the vol volatility range of these alkane alkanes that are formed or found in raw natural gas. And we have uh, methane at the top left corner there, going all the way down to uh, C14 alkanes. And we know that if uh, the boiling point is greater than, um, or sorry, less than uh, ambient temperature, it's going to be in the gas phase and therefore um, want to be found there. However, if we have the uh, boiling point that is greater than um, ambient temperature, it's gonna exist in this uh, vapor or liquid phase. And so that's gonna affect some of the infield processing. So what do you do with these compounds that wanna be in gases and liquids uh, and so on? And so the first classification, those that want to be in the gas phase include these uh, natural gas liquids, ethane, propane, uh, and butane. Generally, they're piped to a centralized uh, gas processing plant within the oil field. In places like the Bakken, where these plants haven't come online very quickly, uh, these are the types of gases that eventually get flared. For the liquid condensate, we now have some of the heavier VOCs, those that will exist as liquids at ambient pressure and temperature. Um, the general range is the C5 to C12 alkanes, but also includes the cycloalkanes and aromatics. These are stored generally on site in these very large condensate tanks. You see them um, all across town in Weld County. And it's important to note gasoline, of course, is a formulated product, but these condensate tanks hold the same kind of compounds that you would typically find in gasoline. But of course, it's an unformulated or raw uh, mixture. 
And lastly, we have the heavy gas oils, things that go to what you may typically think of as crude oil, that sort of black goo uh, that comes out of the ground. And so a very, very brief overview on some of the oil and natural gas, these uh, drilling operations. So this is a picture on the right of a new well going in uh, near our study site in the Uinta Basin in 2012. And so what happens first is, of course, you have to prepare the well pad. And so you're basically uh, leveling the ground, getting um, all your systems in place. Generally, this is the period where you have the most particle emissions, basically dust being kicked up. The second phase is the actual drilling, so putting the well into uh, the ground. And what's amazing is they can reach, you know, several thousands of feet down underground and several thousands of feet out in any one uh, direction. And so what they're able to do is from a single well pad, you can have multiple well bores going out in all separate directions. And that decreases the overall footprint. So you can have, instead of eight individual well pads, you have one well pad with eight wells. And it also means that you can access reservoirs that are underneath existing uh, infrastructure. So houses and schools and towns and all those kinds of things. The next phase is the well completion. So after the well uh, bore is put in, so you basically drilled your hole, now you have to stimulate the well in order to get the production to actually occur. And to do this for the shale formations or these unconventional uh, reservoirs, they use hydraulic fracturing. So that's a mixture of sand, uh, mostly water, and some chemicals that are pumped at high pressure into the well in order to stimulate the uh, production. And as you will see, each one of these steps have slightly different uh, emissions associated with them. So after you've hydraulically fractured the well, all of that stuff that you just pushed down in the well now comes back up to the top. So you have the water, the drill bits, um, you also have now the oil and gas that you're trying to remove. So you get this soup of different chemicals that have to be um, dealt with. Depending on where you are, regulations sort of determine how that uh, flow back is handled. In some cases, you can have a completely closed system. So these are called the green completions. Those are more common here in the front range. And other places like the Uinta Basin, at least when we were there in 2012, they just employ big open pits, dump it all in the ground, and sort of let Mother Nature um, sort it out. All the gases evaporate, the drilling cuttings fall to the bottom, uh, and so on. And so all of these different stages, as well as different regulatory um, rules and guides uh, will determine some of the emissions. And here I've highlighted just some of the potential VOC sources in red. And of course, there are additional uh, nitrogen oxide sources, mainly from the on-site uh, power generation. So we hear a little bit more about this liquid loadout. So you often have lots of semi-truck traffic coming to each individual well pad in order to remove the liquids that start to accumulate in these big uh, tanks there. And again, depending on the regulations, these uh, vapors can be captured, they can be burned, or in the case of Uinta, at least at the time, they can be vented directly to the atmosphere. And so what we wanted to do is employ a variety of platforms. This is done over a wide range in time, so the last uh, five or six years or so, in order to study uh, all of the different components of this really complex uh, system. So we've used uh, the mobile lab in order to do these near source or process level, so things that are happening right on the well pad. Uh, we can characterize the emissions and the variability of all of the different uh, emission sources. But of course, this is really time and labor intensive, and there's tens of thousands of wells across the United States, so it's uh, of somewhat limited use, but still really important. We have several different ground sites that we've used, most notably the Boulder Atmospheric Observatory out in uh, eastern Colorado there, in order to um, do more longer term uh, measurements. And with ground sites, we can have a uh, more or less unlimited instrument payload versus the mobile lab has a very light instrument payload. And the ground sites give us a better idea of uh, characterizing the localized emissions, both day and nighttime, the photochemistry, and then meteorology. And the measurements typically occur uh, anywhere between four to six weeks. And lastly, we've been using uh, the NOAA P3, and other research groups have been using uh, lighter aircraft, such as the Twin Otter and even a smaller Mooney aircraft. And these give a good way to measure basin-wide uh, emissions. It also gives you a good way to calculate uh, emission flux measurements. 
So the picture on the right was taken uh, by Chuck Brock as we flew over the Permian Basin. You see each one of these little brown spots is an individual well pad, and it just goes on um, as far as the eye can see. So we're flying over and downwind of uh, these massive uh, shale basins with these thousands of different wells in them. And I only have one slide on the instruments, and that's this one. And so at the NOAA P3, particularly for the Songnex campaign, we focused obviously on measuring the hydrocarbons. So we have a fast methane uh, analyzer, a lot of the other trace gases, um, and a variety of different measurement techniques for uh, VOCs and non-methane hydrocarbons, including now a fast ethane spectrometer from uh, Aerodyne and our new uh, proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometer which has a very high time resolution and mass resolution that can measure hundreds of oxidized or uh, oxygenated VOCs and hydrocarbons. And the instrument I run, the discrete whole air samplers, so why we only get up to 72 samples per flight. These provide very detailed chemical snapshots that are used in conjunction with the high time resolution measurements in order to get the most uh, detailed chemical measurements of oil and natural gas operations. And so we'll jump into the data. So this is uh, data collected by Karsten in uh, the Uinta Basin in 2012, maybe 14, 2014. And so what he did is instrument the, uh, the mobile lab shown here with a variety of instruments, including methane and a PTRMS, and drove it on uh, different well pads throughout the Uinta Basin and then over the Colorado border and Rangeley, Colorado, which is uh, the Peons Basin. You can see from um, the pictures here, we have a variety of different types of well pads. So we have natural gas, a dry natural gas. So you don't have any of these extra equipment, such as the condensate tanks, the separators, and so on. And then we also have uh, the oil well. Um, these are the pump jacks uh, that are a pretty iconic picture. What's also interesting about the Uinta Basin is that the oil and gas producing regions are um, pretty well separated. So oil on the western side, uh, gas on the eastern side. We had a ground site here um, in the middle, and then Kirsten drove the van around uh, the basin in order to capture the emissions of these different types of equipment on these well pads. And so now if we look at the top picture, and what the next slide is going to be is an aerial view looking down on this very same well pad. So we have the condensate tank, the wellhead, the methanol tank, and the separator. And that's now shown here. And the drive track of that van driving on this well pad is now colored by the individual compounds shown up here. So we have methane, methanol, toluene, and NO2. The wind direction is coming uh, from left to right in this picture. And you can see that each individual piece of equipment has a slightly different VOC source signature downwind of these. So the condensate tanks will have a large source of methanol and toluene versus uh, the compressor and the separator here. You see a lot of methane coming out and also NO2. So we can see that each individual piece of equipment on a well pad has a different uh, VOC source signature. And this is important mostly for the bottom up types of uh, emission inventories. And then next, uh, this is work done by Jeff Collette's group. So this was just published uh, late last year. And what they did is they went around to different well pads in uh, the front range and measured the emission rate, so these mass fluxes that are coming out of individual stages of a well completion. So if we start here looking at the hydraulic fracturing um, shown here and the well completion phase, we see that each stage of the uh, development activities has a different um, amount and uh, characterization of VOC emissions. And so during uh, the hydraulic fracturing, it's maybe somewhat surprising that the emissions are quite low. But intuitively, it makes sense. You're actually pushing things down into the well rather than letting the emissions come back up out of the well. And that's what happens in this flowback phase. So you see the difference between these two stages of a well uh, completion as characterized here. And then for the longer term uh, production, uh, shown in the first of these uh, box and whisker plots, we see that it generally trends with the gas composition as well as the volatility. So the most abundant, most volatile gases will have uh, larger emissions during production as we go through uh, the chemical inventory. 
And this last bit, this liquid loadout. So that's when the tanker truck comes to the site, removes the hydrocarbons that are stored in these condensate tanks, we see very high emission rates of all the VOCs that they reported um, for the front range measurements during this very short uh, time period event. And so this could be one place where uh, you could capture uh, these emissions perhaps a little bit better. But it's also important to remember that this occurs only sporadically throughout a field versus the production occurs long term, uh, day and night across the whole basin uh, with thousands of wells. All right, so on to the uh, identification of the emission sources. So the list is shown on the top right of just potential VOC sources here in the front range. So how can we tease out what is oil and natural gas when we have a potential slew of other emission sources here in the front range? So this is important to identify and do these sort of source apportionment type of uh, calculations, particularly for methane, again, a greenhouse gas, but also the VOCs and nitrogen oxides, which are the ozone precursors. So currently, uh, shown, um, outlined here in green, we have uh, in 2007 to this day, we are, the Denver Front Range is in the ozone non-attainment as uh, dictated by the EPA. And so the local um, regulatory uh, agencies like CDPHE need ways to figure out how to reduce uh, the ozone precursors and understanding where they're coming from and how they can um, potentially reduce them is very important. And so we have uh, some local air quality implications and I won't be showing any of the data uh, in this talk. I tried to put it together in time. But there is, of course, in the summer of 2014, a great number of you here um, participated in the Frappe Discovery AQ. And there are uh, over 10 flights, I think, in the front range measuring all of these ozone precursors, trying to get at um, how we can meet this ozone attainment status. And so I wanted to start sort of back um, in the beginning. This is work done by Gabby Patron at NOAA GMD. And the idea was very simple. Put a Picaro analyzer in a Prius and drive it around town and see what you see. And it turns out this fairly simple experiment, at least to start, sort of uh, led the way. It was on the leading front of a whole slew of research um, conducted afterwards. And so what you can see, the survey started on the uh, southwest corner, driving around, we hit one large plume of methane from a local landfill. But as you start to get to the north end of town, closer to Wattenberg Field, as shown with all these oil and gas wells here, you start to see an uptick in methane. We can now add our latest measurements of methane from uh, Jeff Peichel. This is one of our flights uh, on the 13th of May in 2015 aboard the NOAA P3. And you can see with the same uh, color coding here for methane, you see very large enhancements, at least over background, of methane directly over uh, the Wattenberg field. And so in order to source a portion methane, we need to add some additional uh, measurements, so some additional chemical species. So biogenic methane sources, uh, such as those from agriculture, don't have a lot of these other hydrocarbons, the other alkanes. However, thermogenic or fossil sources of methane do. And so on the right, I'm going to overlay a methane, or sorry, an ethane trace, so the next carbon species up. And you can see that the colors just barely change. So we have a co-location and enhancement of alkanes along with methane indicating that this is a dominant source, the fossil fuel source from oil and natural gas operations in the Denver Front Range is a very important uh, methane source here. Now we can start adding more compounds. These are the species uh, that I measure with the canister system and online uh, measurements. And so on the left, I have box and whisker plots of ethyne, also known as acetylene. This is a very common uh, combustion tracer. And I have it for a number of different, uh, these are all ground sites that we've been to. So Houston, Texas, heavily industrialized uh, petrochemical industry. Pasadena, California, typical of a large uh, urban area. Boulder, so right in our lab. Uh, Fort Collins, Weld County, that's at BAO. And then in the Uinta County. We can see that we don't see very much difference in this overall distribution of acetylene between these uh, measurements. However, we see this uptick in uh, propane. 
And if we compare that to a range of 28 US cities in the literature, we see these enhanced propane values for all the sites studied here in the Front Range and in the Uinta Basin. So those are the data sets that have the enhanced propane. So now if we look at the correlation, we basically see there isn't much of a correlation, but these very large enhancements of propane relative to acetylene, this combustion tracer. And if we look at, again, this ratio of propane over acetylene and now apply it to the airborne measurements, again, we see these enhancements of propane that are not associated with a combustion source directly over uh, Wattenberg Field, indicating that that is a good uh, source of alkanes here in the front range. And we see a uh, very poor correlation between propane and ethyne, and that's because they're from disparate sources. But if we look at compounds that are common to a single source, such as the oil and natural gas. So here I have ethane versus propane and pink, and then pentane versus propane and purple. We see very, very tight correlations. And we also see, again, these very large enhancements of all the alkanes that are associated with oil and natural gas uh, operations. And so next I'll be looking at and comparing the slopes of each of these species for here in the front range, so ethane versus propane, uh, on through. And these are enhancement ratios. They are different than emission ratios. These are the observed slopes of these correlation plots. And it's useful to uh, use the enhancement ratios rather than an overall abundance like the mixing ratios that I showed on the previous slide because these enhancement ratios help minimize uh, the effects of air mass mixing and dilution. And so now I have this category plot where each marker here represents the slope of ethane versus propane uh, and so on down the line with propane versus propane, of course, having a slope of one. And these are now comparisons of our ground-based measurements in winter of 2011 and summer of uh, 2012. We see a uh, slight enhancement in some of the heavier alkanes and cycloalkanes and aromatics. This could be due to additional uh, summertime sources or it could also be due to, or at least uh, partially due to, the evaporation from condensate tanks. So as temperatures warm up, that vapor phase is going to become more um, abundant, and we could be seeing um, the evaporation of a lot of these species, potentially from oil and natural gas operations in the summertime. And lastly, we can add some of the measurements that we did for uh, the P3 overpasses, and we see very good um, correlations in terms of this overall uh, chemical signature between the airborne measurements and the ground-based measurements over the last four years. So the composition within the basin is not necessarily changing. However, the emissions and certainly the production are. And so what does this mean for some of the local air quality? Well, one very, very simple uh, metric that we employ is the OH reactivity as shown here. And the main point of this slide is that the Denver Basin, particularly in the summer, basically is a mix of sort of a more pure uh, oil and natural gas uh, emission profile and that you would typically see in a urban area. The biogenic slice of the puzzle is uh, still important to quantify. We can try to reduce uh, some of the anthropogenic emissions, but the natural emissions uh, will occur as they will. And so understanding how they relate to the anthropogenic sources uh, will be important for research to come. And with our new uh, advanced instrumentation and some uh, detective work by our graduate student, we have uh, some observations of some new compounds. Uh, so what she noticed is uh, we had a response on mass 137, which is typically associated with monoterpenes. However, we were in the Permian Basin in the spring, and there simply aren't a lot of uh, biogenic sources of monoterpenes. So it's apparently uh, common in the geochemical world uh, that these diamondoid compounds, so these caged uh, structures that have the exact same uh, formula as monoterpenes, but a very different source. And so potentially this mass 137 response is due uh, to these diamondoid compounds, the smallest of which is shown here, which is adamantane. And perhaps uh, some additional interesting compounds are these heterocyclic uh, nitrogen species. Typically, we would sort of associate these with a biomass burning source. But again, we had no other tracers uh, for biomass burning. And we see uh, the traces here match that pretty well um, in correlation with uh, known oil and natural gas sources, such as uh, benzene. 
and they can perhaps be coming from these uh, structures called porphyrins, which again are common in uh, geochemical um, science, which could be uh, ultimately related to chlorophyll, so the plants that died that made the fossil fuel um, to start with. And what's interesting in terms of the atmospheric chemistry is we can possibly use these as chemical fingerprints now for the actual reservoir, but they also have um, fairly high reactivities, particularly for uh, the nitrate radical. So understanding the sources of these um, is still an ongoing uh, activity in our lab. And next we'll be going on to some of the uh, airborne measurements. So collectively on this map, we have all the different flight tracks now overlaid with the different shale basins. We have now covered um, over 70% of the shale gas produced and approximately 83% of the total crude oil produced. So we've covered the most number of basins with the majority of uh, the shale oil and natural gas production and now with the most uh, chemically detailed uh, instrument payload. And so back to the uh, enhancement ratios, this is now comparing all of the different basins um, that we've studied. And uh, all the graphs on the right are the ethane versus uh, methane ratio. The different colors on the right um, show multiple flights um, for different basins uh, that we went to. And you can start to, again, see very different uh, slopes here, or these enhancement ratios. But you also get a sense for the scale of uh, the overall um, emission. So the Permian had by far the highest um, observed mixing ratios for a number of different uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, however, the Bakken had uh, the steepest slopes, so the largest enhancement ratios. So the category plot on the right, all I've done is taken these slopes and represented them as the bar charts there. And for the next slide, I've summed all of the species that we've measured, grouped them into the chemical uh, classes shown here. And I've normalized it now, so all of these are just on a scale from 0 to 1. And I did it for the maximum um, sum of the VOC class. And in this case, that was Bakken. So Bakken had the highest uh, collective uh, emission or enhancement ratios for all of the VOCs uh, measured here. And so what we see is we see that same sort of decreasing trend um, with the basins kept in the same order there for the light alkanes, but that trend starts to uh, degrade as we start adding more and more chemical species. So this is pointing to the fact that each one of these individual basins has a very unique chemical signature. So just measuring methane and ethane won't necessarily help you predict how much benzene and toluene and cycloalkanes that are there. If you want to know the chemical uh, signature, you have to go out uh, and measure it, or at least uh, use our measurements for now. And so we have uh, different classes here. We have some of the basins that have the largest uh, collective enhancement ratios, with Be uh, Bakken being at the top. The next sort of class, um, so we have more moderate enhancement ratios, but uh, relatively large uh, aromatic uh, contribution. And lastly, the basins that don't really have um, a whole lot of sources. Potentially, some of these benzene um, emissions are from other individual activities within the basin or potentially a different uh, source besides oil and natural gas. So for the next slide, if we add up all of the compounds now and represent it as this uh, non-methane uh, mole fraction, so we're summing up all the hydrocarbons, non-methane hydrocarbons, over the sum of all hydrocarbons measured, including methane, we can start to compare uh, the different basins. So we have those with the low uh, non-methane hydrocarbon mole fraction onto the next set, and then lastly, the Bakken. And so we have uh, a range of these different gas mixtures. Um, very small non-methane hydrocarbon fraction is termed by the industry to be a very dry gas mix. And then of course the Bakken, Permian, uh, denver Julesburg here in the front range, these are gonna be basins that have a very wet mixture or um, proportionately larger non-methane hydrocarbons relative to methane. And so we can look at now how we measure, so we've covered the composition, but how do we get at the mass fluxes? How much is actually emitted? And this is work uh, done by Jeff Peichel. This is one example of a uh, flight in the Bakken. And so here, the uh, crude oil production is shown in a gridded inventory. So the darker the box is the area of the most uh, production. Uh, the wind's coming from the south east. Uh, and we see larger enhancements of methane on the downwind legs uh, for this particular flight. 
And if we overlay now the canister measurements, um, and this is now propane, the next carbon up um, from ethane, we see there, again, co-location of these sources. So where we see the enhanced methane, we also see these enhancements in propane. And we can look at the individual uh, correlations of all of these different VOCs relative to methane for the downwind uh, portion used here. And we can then scale up the uh, VOC emission fluxes using the value calculated from the high time resolution measurements, uh, such as the methane uh, spectrometer. So this value is calculated from um, a mass balance approach. You uh, account for how much methane is on the upwind legs and how the enhancement um, is on the downwind legs. And that difference can be used to determine how much mass is emitted uh, between the upwind and the downwind legs. So we get the methane flux, use these different VOCs, um, some pretty simple math to calculate each of the VOC fluxes. And the number at the bottom here represents the sum of all VOCs measured, not just the three here. We can compare these to a previous study done just the prior year to ours, uh, done by Eric Court and Gabby Patron and Colm Sweeney and all of those who did the methane and ethane fluxes, and we essentially get the exact uh, same number. But what's really eye-opening is comparing these emission fluxes to the total anthropogenic uh, sources, uh, and this is from the Edgar model. So this one particular basin, at least on this one day, can account from anywhere between two to three percent of the total anthropogenic emissions of these alkanes, um, which is pretty astonishing given the, the small uh, physical area of uh, the Bakken. And so we'll be looking at extending uh, graphs done like this. So this was uh, Jeff's recent study for the Haynesville, Fayetteville, and Marcellus, but it's included some previous studies uh, from the denver julesburg Basin. And basically these are the emission fluxes that I showed. Uh, the top plot is the production, and the percent lost um, is a fraction of the two. What's most important to note is that the uh, emissions here do not necessarily scale with production. So again, you can't predict what the emissions are gonna be strictly knowing uh, how much oil or natural gas is being produced within a given basin. And so this is uh, very preliminary results, but from our uh, song next flights here, compared to those previous measurements, we see that the uh, measured emission flux does not significantly uh, vary from previous measurements done by another group um, at NOAA there. And so on to the environmental um, impacts. So this is sort of a, a wider range of topics, but things that I found um, super interesting. So this is an aerial view of uh, the Permian Basin uh, near Andrews, Texas. And this is from an article in the Washington Post that came out not too recently. And they've highlighted here these individual well sites. So the next picture is from only 10 years later. And so you just see this massive change in the land use. So this is what happens. Again, the only way you can continue production is to continue adding more and more wells. And the Permian is one place that they've been um, actively adding uh, some of these wells. Um, another interesting fact are earthquakes. So I know we've had a few here in Colorado. I just did a Google search this morning and there's apparently a house resolution bill that just passed um, the state house. That's now in the state Senate. Um, basically trying to hold uh, oil and gas companies liable for any damage from man-made earthquakes related to the oil and natural gas development. So this is just an image again from a newspaper uh, article showing the sharp increase in man-made um, earthquakes in central Oklahoma. And this has been linked um, from several different studies to the act of pumping that used hydraulic uh, fracturing fluid or the wastewater back into these disposal wells. So it's not the actual act of production, but it's getting rid of um, the water that's causing uh, these earthquakes here. And for the most part, the um, wastewater that comes or is associated with oil and natural gas production simply cannot be reused because it has such high levels of salts and then of course it's contaminated with other chemicals. So once it comes up to the surface, the only place for it to go is to be pumped back down into uh, these disposal wells. Lastly, we have uh, the study on wintertime ozone. So we got to spend uh, three lovely winters in the Uinta Basin, 
Uh, the first of which uh, that we went out there in 2012, we were out there to investigate uh, this idea of, it's not an idea, it's an occurrence, a very high wintertime ozone. So this was first observed uh, again by a NOAA group, Rushnell, um, for the Green River uh, Basin in Wyoming. And this is uh, from an EPA uh, monitor for these different sites. We have Pasadena, California. I pulled in uh, one right here from the Front Range. And this is from uh, basically January 1st to December 31st. And what we see is this normal sort of uptick in summertime ozone. And that's um, why we are in non-attainment. We've gone over this national standard one too many times. But we see these just very large, there's no other word for it, enhancements in these uh, ozone measurements out in the Uinta Basin, but they only occur in the wintertime. And in comparison, these are the uh, highest measured ozone values and then the number of days that they were in exceedance. So for three, the three months in winter from January to March, 49 days were essentially unhealthy air out there. So we had some of the highest recorded um, ozone values in the entire United States out in the Uinta Basin where there's only 60,000 people um, that live there. So we went out there to investigate it. And so the very short uh, take on how to make a wintertime ozone is the first find a good spot. So you have to have a basin, in this case it's a structural basin, so it's surrounded by land, uh, higher land on all three sides, so it sort of traps the emissions, sort of like a bathtub. You have to add the VOC and NOx sources. And this is a picture that I took when we were out there. I guess that one, I took this one, but it has Yost's name on it. He took the next one. Um, doesn't look like there's a whole lot out there, but if I now highlight all of the different VOC sources, so those are those condensate tanks, the wellheads, um, and so on. The next ingredient, which we missed that first year, is snow. And so uh, this is the Uinta Basin after a snowfall uh, the following year. You can start to see the sort of haze that permeates uh, the basin there. And the snow does several things. It helps set up these inversion layers so you get a very, very shallow um, volume of air where all of these emissions are trapped in. The sun increases the albedo so you get twice as much sunlight as you normally would um, in the winter time. And, uh, starts to kick off uh, some of the chemistry. And so the last thing we needed, which uh, was the true piece of the puzzle here, we had to find the radical sources that initiate the ozone chemistry. So as we know, uh, it takes ozone to make ozone, but in this case, there wasn't enough um, uh, ozone from these, or sorry, these radicals from primary sources, including uh, ozone chemistry, in order to uh, result in these very high and fast uh, ozone production rates. So it turns out it's from the VOCs. And so the majority of the radical sources that initiated those very high uh, wintertime ozone events are from the oxidized VOCs formed um, from the photochemical reaction. So this is primary, uh, secondary formation from primary um, alkanes and aromatics. And so we've done uh, some more modeling work on that, um, from a variety of different uh, models. This work was done by uh, Ravon, basically showing uh, now this is the measurements in black, and so we get these uh, stagnation events where ozone just keeps building until eventually a weather system comes through and cleans out the basin. Uh, the model is shown in red, and that's using our measured uh, emissions as uh, opposed to the um, EPA-based uh, emission inventory. And of course, with the models, what you can do is you can start to play around with different sources, turning them on and off. And so the green trace here is uh, the model run without VOCs from oil and natural gas. And you see the ozone uh, completely goes away in the model run when you're not including um, those VOCs. So of course, the conclusion is, um, these uh, very high wintertime rapid photochemical formation of ozone is uh, driven mostly by the emissions of VOCs from the oil and natural gas activities in uh, that basin. And so again, some more local work. This is work done uh, by Detlev Helmig. And so what they've done is measured uh, different alkanes, uh, methane, ethane, and propane, um, plus a few more from different flask samples uh, collected around the world. And so the main way to read this is the warmer col colors 
show that propane is increasing. So this is a 10 year long trend, I believe. The different um, marker shapes basically just represent the different types of samples and the larger markers are those that are more confident. So we see this reversal and what was a, a propane decline, it's now um, increasing again. And this has been um, linked at least in part to uh, the shale oil and natural gas production <coughs> boom that's occurred uh, in the Northern hemisphere. And lastly, just because I think it's a uh, pretty gorgeous picture, but again, we're seeing the composition of the global atmosphere change, and we can also see the changes in uh, both land use and energy production um, from space. So this is, uh, again, work done by a different NOAA group that isolates uh, different wavelengths in order to um, find where the flares are as opposed to uh, urban areas here. So we can see Eagle Ford, Permian, and of course the Bakken and Marcellus uh, flaring from space um, from oil and natural gas activities. All right, so in summary, I know I threw uh, a lot of information at you, but I just wanted to recap and of course stating that the emissions from oil and natural gas, I like the word volatile, so again, they wanna be in the gas phase, but they're also uh, very dynamic uh, and changing, and it can change for a number of reasons, from the individual types of uh, well pad equipment to the emission um, well production stages, and then of course uh, from the reservoirs that uh, the oil and natural gas is being uh, produced from. The emissions of uh, methane and VOCs are unique uh, to each individual basin. Um, and what we've shown is these oil and natural gas uh, sources are very distinctive. We can easily separate them from a variety of other uh, emission sources and that'll make uh, source apportionment exercises hopefully a lot uh, more straightforward. And of course, that's uh, these oil and natural gas operations. So that large increase in shale oil and natural gas production is uh, associated with a significant source of both methane and VOCs uh, to the atmosphere, uh, particularly within the basins themselves. And just for the one example that I've shown in the Bakken, uh, the emissions are equivalent to one to 3% of the total global anthropogenic emissions of alkanes. And it's uh, important to characterize not only the emissions of methane and VOCs, but all the other sources, including NOx, which I didn't mention a whole lot of, nitrogen oxides, in order to assess some of these uh, environmental impacts from energy uh, production. So while natural gas is a clean burning fuel, if a lot of it leaks, it helps offset the climate benefits that we would uh, be receiving from that clean burning fuel. And of course, gave a number of different um, topics for uh, environmental impacts. So essentially from the ground up. So earthquakes to land use changes to air quality issues and global um, composition change. So that's uh, all I have today. I wanted to thank all of you for being here and for NCAR for hosting me um, and all of that. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So um, we are recording this, so I'm gonna pass around the microphone for any questions. So any questions? Eric has one. Jessica, you mentioned that there wasn't a correlation between emission and production. So is there a correlation between emission and something else <laughs> if it is uh, we're still looking for it so ideally if we could find what these correlations are it's most important for some of the modeling and the inventory work and this is just showing that things are so variable and so different among each of the basins that it's hard to find these uh, inventories that are going to be accurate for a nationwide style uh, emission source inventory That was a nice talk, Jessica. One thing, you know, the um, uh, it seems like one of the bigger environmental impacts is going around and they're poking holes all over the countryside everywhere, right? I mean, so you have like 
situation where, you know, new roads are being built and some of this countryside in Texas and eastern and western Colorado, it's such a fragile ecosystem and things like that. Um, the question I have is, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but is there any any consideration giving being given to that as far as um, you know in in legislative branches about the environmental impact of just that the the you know the destruction of the sort of <laughs> ecosystem uh, I would certainly hope so as well, so I'm not uh, super familiar with all of uh, the regulatory side of all of this, but um, there's certainly been a lot of questions on even just setbacks, so how far away building a house, but in terms of rivers and wildlife sanctuaries and those kinds of things. Um, from having talked with a few of the engineers you know, years ago, they do have to do um, assessments of where they're gonna put in a well pad. So we, there was a story from the Uinta Basin about um, some owl or a salamander or something wanted to have, that was its natural habitat. And they had to make sure that this, call it a salamander, wasn't there in order for them to put in the well. So they do have to do some assessments, at least in terms of wildlife, um, certainly hopefully for you know water resources as well. Um, what happens to the afterwards? Are they, the, do the oil company, oil and gas companies, you know, when they leave, they're short. These things are short-lived. They don't last very long. Then they move to another one. Yeah. What happens to the ones they leave behind? As far as I know, they are supposed to sort of reclaim the land, so remove all the equipment, plants, whatever um, native, you know, grasses and shrubs that are uh, supposed to be there. Um, an interesting story was in the Uinta Basin is they never expected the oil and natural gas industry to last as long as it did. So they put a lot of their infrastructure above ground so that it would be easier for them to remove it, not knowing that the shale boom was coming. And now they have a lot of equipment that isn't necessarily made or um, adequate for the temperature ranges that you see in the, in the Uinta Basin there. Um, so the general idea is at least in that particular area is that they were gonna clean it all out take the equipment with them, um, but it's still there and it's still in use. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is true in urban legend, but I have a friend in Utah <laughs> who said that a lot of the old equipment in, U in the Uinta Basin or in Utah actually comes from Colorado after it's used, it's gone through its useful life here because our regulations, especially on the Front Range, are more strict than they are in Utah. So. Yeah, I, that would make sense. I haven't heard that myself, but. So actually this gets to my question, which is, if it doesn't depend on production, can you see a pattern with state regulatory? I mean, obviously, like you just said, Colorado is is stricter, and you hinted at that with the Utah versus the Peasen, no, Peasen? Yeah, Peons. Peons, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a hard one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just. Yeah, so that is uh, the big question. So there's been a lot of regulatory activity here in the front range. You have some of the strictest uh, emission standards and things that are um, sort of a test bed that may be applied uh, nationwide. Um, but as we've shown, at least with the composition, we don't see a change. So perhaps the uh, you're still seeing emissions from the condensate tanks um, and so on. And then some of the longer term trends. So with that methane uh, flux measurement that was just preliminary measurements, uh, numbers from Jeff, even though production has greatly increased, we don't, we basically see a flat line in terms of the overall methane emission fluxes. So it's, um, a little bit of a mixed bag, but that is the driving question. Is all of the regulation that's gone into place worth it? Is it actually making an impact or perhaps not? Or is it offsetting the production, increasing any savings you have from reducing emissions? So I don't have the answer to that, but that is like the number one question that we have. Becky? I'm still really fascinated by the um, the wintertime ozone in Uinta. Good. And I had a question about the modeling, because it looked like you, the modeling was capturing the, the daytime ozone maximum, but it looked like it totally missed the, like it, it super underestimated what was happening at night. Is that because of where you were measuring? And I can't remember if there was like nighttime measurements, um, vertical yeah. measurements of ozone. 
Yeah, so that particular trace is from Ravon, but if you look at the Edwards Nature paper, it does capture the, the ozone variability. So it's just how the models were effectively set up. So Pete's, Pete used the MCM and more of a box, uh, box model type measurement or uh, calculation. And then Ravon used, I think, the Wharf Chem measurements. So the trick was, of course, capturing the date, the maximum um, daytime ozone production. And what I didn't show is Pete Edwards' work does capture that emission, or the uh, trend, sorry, in ozone. <laughs> All the way in the back. With regard to the Collette paper, when they're talking about the liquid loadout, do you know if or how they account for um, averaging that into the overall emissions since it's such a short time that, that, that those high emissions actually account for the total emissions? Um, so the box and whisker plots that I showed are the emission rates that are instantaneously occurring. So they use a tracer release method. And so they were on site with all of their equipment when it just so happened that a liquid loadout was happening. So that is the physical measurement or the distribution of measurements that they conducted during that. So how, uh, for instance, CDPHE will take that number, so the emission rate times however many liquid loadouts are occurring across the greater basin um, is a harder question uh, to answer, but that's um, balancing these sort of acute emissions are very high but short duration as opposed to tens of thousands of wells having a lower uh, emission rate um, but over a much longer period of time goes into the inventory questions that uh, they're still trying to figure out how to deal with all of this because the the general answer is the current inventories just don't agree well with what we're measuring in the field so then you would uh, need at least somebody or the companies to actually regularly track uh, how often these these uh, vehicles are coming in and the, how much loadout is actually going on. Exactly, and it'll vary by basin. So the Front Range has a lot more infrastructure where you don't necessarily need to rely on taker trucks as much. However, in the Uinta Basin, almost every single well pad was serviced by a tanker truck. So again, when you start thinking about the nationwide puzzle, it starts to get even more complicated even quicker. Thank you. It's like being on a game show. <laughs> Do I win any money? <laughs> yeah, nice talk, Jessica. I was wondering, uh, following on from Eric's question a little bit, the horizontal drilling, is that kind of new and expensive? It seems like it make, make a lot more sense just to have one site with lots of things radiating and a lot less trucks driving around, but there must be some drawbacks. Drawbacks to the horizontal? Yeah, either economic or, or what? No, well, yeah. it's... Um, you know, fairly new technology, so in the last maybe 10, 15 years. Um, but as of right now, it is sort of the go-to style of drilling. So they have decreased the costs, the time, uh, and all of that associated with the horizontal drilling. So in most cases, that is um, the most number of new wells being put in employ the horizontal drilling, and that is to access these uh, shale and tight reservoirs because they occur in a very, very shallow layer. So if you just drilled it down vertically, you'd only have you know, a very small cross section. But if you go the full length of this very thin sheet, you get access to, of course, more of the reservoir. And do we have any idea, like emissions from those? I mean, do you get these big bursts of stuff like the, right. the, the wash back or whatever it's called? Uh, yeah, the flow back. Flow back to get, <laughs> is that reduced, you know, or anything? Or? Um, no, I mean, it's, it is associated with, uh, with the hydraulic fracturing, and which typically goes with the horizontal drilling. So they're kind of all, all in the same basket. The conventional style of drilling is just put it, you know, drill straight down. It's a much shallower reservoir, easier to get to, generally a much drier content, not always. So you don't need, again, all of that extra equipment on site, such as the condensate tanks um, and so on. And so with the the flowback, of course, it occurs during just a 
fairly short window of time, but it's sort of the, the messiest part, at least in my personal opinion, of bringing a new well um, online. Microphone is near. Um, could you comment on the threshold leak value for methane, the percentage <laughs> at which methane becomes worse than CO2 or better than CO2 if it's below it, and how close we may be to it, and whether your measurements suggest that we're on the opposite side that perhaps industry reporting Yeah, is so it's definitely a number that's uh, been up for debate. The sort of standard range is right around 3% of a, of a leak rate. Uh, I don't know the actual emission rate offhand. So if you nationwide of every single well leaked 3%, then we would be offsetting any of the climate gains from burning the clean methane as opposed to um, other fossil fuel sources. As we've seen from individual basins, the number can be quite high in terms of this leak rate. So the Uinta Basin had one of the highest uh, percents, I should say, and that was uh, upwards of 6%. Percent. Yeah. Yep, and that, that is that magic uh, threshold. But how that one basin compares nationwide with others being under the threshold, and so getting these accurate emission fluxes for the widest number of basins will get a more accurate picture for nationwide emissions associated with oil and natural gas activities. I think that one thing that complicates that question is a lot of the total leaks comes in a few big events. Like, I think it's the former, because there's been some recent publications talking about, um, like they, they identify certain lakes, like a valve is not open or something, you know, some, some big mistake is responsible for something like 60 percent. Um, are you familiar yeah, with Yeah, well, it depends on the study. So it's, I think you're referencing David Allen's work. Um, and a lot of it also depends on the basin. So if we had these very large emission sources, you'd expect to see more evidence in that in these downwind um, sort of measurements that we're doing. And we don't see as many of these big plumes as you would expect if a single source within a well um, a shale basin is contributing the majority of the emotions, we, or emissions, sorry. We see these broad distribution of uh, enhancements of a wide range of species downwind of these shale basins. So I think it's a, it's a mix of the two, these sort of constant little drip, 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 <laughs> and then the big sort of tidal wave occurring at the same time within a basin. So I had one more question, and maybe you don't know the answer, but I'm just kind of going back to the horizontal drilling. Is it? Is it some sort of robotics that can go down and then guide it to the side, but still be controlled from a single point on top? Like yeah, so kind I've of looked fascinating, in, fascinating technology. It is, and it's uh, it's horizontal, but it has a very long. They call it the heel, so it's a very long turning radius to get it to go horizontal. So it's not like a ninety degree angle um, by any means, but they can uh, basically just control the drill bit in a way so that it's constantly changing directions, but just infinitesimally so that over many thousands of feet, it will change uh, its angle. But yeah, how they do that is just mind boggling. All right, so thank you.